Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. everyone. Um, so before we start, um, we, uh, we go around and say our names. So my name is Juan. Grisha. Bob. Ray. Jeff. Jim. Tony. Don. Jack. Jim. Jerry. Stephanie. Tim. My name is Cass. Jay. Welcome everyone. Um, and so, um, well, our speaker today um, is uh, Bob Stahl. Um, uh, Bob has founded eight mindfulness-based stress reduction programs in medical centers in the San Francisco Bay Area and is currently offering programs at El Camino Hospital in Mountain View, California. Welcome, Bob. Thank you for being with us. Well, first of all, I want to thank Chris, who reached out to me um, by email to... Um, if I would be interested in coming to to offer a, a talk, and I was happy to do that. So thank you so much for um, inviting me and and for your fellowship to and welcome me here. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I was asking Chris uh, about. Um, you know, what do you want me to talk about? And um, Chris was very open, you know, talk about anything you want, but you might want to mention something about what brought you to Buddhism, so I could do that, and and, um, and how that got entangled with mindfulness-based stress reduction, and then um, I believe that he may have sent out uh, some information about a practice that I'm very much um involved with called the 32 parts of the body meditation. Is that right? Did you all, some of you receive something about that as well? So this will be kind of a, a tapestry of, of these areas. And um, yeah, what, what brought, you know, I could say what brought me to this practice um, was that at a very early age, I um, experienced a lot of death growing up, and um, actually even prior to experiencing death, I had a realization that I and everyone was going to die and that it could happen at any moment, and that was when I was four years old, growing up in the Boston area in Brighton and driving down Corey Hill Road one day in the back seat of my parents' car. We were heading to my grandmother's house. And um, I, I don't know if my parents were talking about death or not, but I had this unmistakable realization at the age of four that I was going to die, that everyone was going to die, and that it could happen at any moment. And I remember sharing this with my mother and father with my new discovery of uh, the inevitability of death that can come at any moment. and. I remember my mother turning around because my father was driving and she said to me, don't worry, Bobby, it's not going to happen for a long, long time. And um, I still have that visceral sense of her wanting to try to comfort me. But what I knew was what I knew, and that was that she was not telling me the truth because death could come at any moment. There was no guarantee it was going to be a long time, and what is a long time anyway? I remember talking with my Burmese meditation teacher, Lindit Seto, on his 80th birthday, and I asked the Seto, uh, you're now 80 years. How, how long has 80 years been? And he looked at me, and he smiled, and he answered it this way. 
80 years. 80 years. 80 years. Where does the time go? And I remember, actually, my wife sharing this story with me about her teaching. She also teaches MBSR. And on the first night of a, of a class, the first class, you go around the circle and, and you hear about where, what brings you here. And this one man says, uh, what brings me here is I'm 46 years old and the last thing I remember I was 21 and I don't know what happened in the last number of years. Where did it go? So after this uh, realization that I was uh, going to die, and that is a powerful moment when you realize that it's going to happen. How many of you recall the moment you realized that it was all going to last? Does anybody recall that moment in your own life? You could raise your hands. Or maybe you're finding out just today for the first time you're going to die. Sorry if I'm giving you this news. <laughs> but it's a powerful moment. It's a powerful moment. It was for me anyways. And... Um, The way of the world, which has its mystery, um, that this was reinforced, the truth of this, and that by the time I was nine years old, I lost my brother who died of an illness. We, we stayed in the same room together, as well as my best friend who lived across the street, and then my grandfather who lived downstairs. So these are very powerful experiences in my early life that left me very lost and very confused for many years. Lost and confused about what is this life? And I was growing up, as you can probably see, um, I'm 68, so um, the Vietnam War was happening. Dylan was saying in the times are changing, the Beatles grew their hair long, and I was incredibly confused and lost. My mother kept on saying as I was growing up, don't worry, the war will be, war will be over before you get, you know, because there's a draft, but I ended up, um, the war was still going on when I was in high school, and I did get in the lottery, but I had a very high draft um, number, so I, I wasn't called in, and then actually, maybe a half a year later, the, the war ended. So, to me, growing up was a very confusing time. I was very lost. And actually, I could say probably um, pretty accurately that I was so lost that I didn't even know how lost I was, because that's how lost I was. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I, I wasn't really that interested in school, and school didn't really make much sense to me. But I did barely manage to graduate, and, um, and I didn't know quite what to do in life. You know, I was working at a chicken restaurant, and a friend of mine said, you know, I'm going to take a fifth year of, of, of high school to try to get into a college. You want to join me? And, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to to think about that and, and to say yes and, and to do that. And while I was doing this fifth year, you know, my friend was going to go to college. And so I started thinking about maybe this, maybe this is what I should do. And I, and I felt, you know, of course, with my white privilege, uh, I was able to do this. And um, in looking at different schools to go to, um, I got into downhill skiing, so I wanted to go to a place where I could ski and have a good time. So I ended up getting into a small liberal arts college in the northeast kingdom of Vermont called Linden State College. I love that there's still kingdoms somewhere, and then Caledonia County in the northeast corner of Vermont is called the Northeast Kingdom. And I got accepted there, and for the first couple of years I majored in skiing, getting drunk, getting high, and trying to have girlfriends. And um, at the end of two years, um, I got a very thin 
envelope from my school and I opened it up and it said that I had flunked out of college. And so that was um, not good. <laughs> and my parents, of course, were very upset. And uh, we went through a process and I was able to be readmitted with a warning. And then I had to look... Um, my mother begged me to see if there's any courses that I had any interest in. Uh, you know, my whole life I've been having reading, writing, arithmetic, history, science, and you know all these wonderful courses. I don't. There's nothing wrong with any of these. They're wonderful, but I. They, they didn't speak to me. I was just so lost, confused, and. Um, and so she said, "Well, look at the catalog. Maybe there's something." And, and then something caught my interest. And I could understand the first half of the name of the course, but the last half I couldn't even pronounce the words. The first half was the wisdom of the East. The second half was Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Zen, which I couldn't even pronounce at the time. But there was something about the wisdom of the East that um, sparked my interest. And I think it was because of, again, this is probably maybe not very, I don't know, good thing to say in these days, but what, what what got my interest was that growing up, I also had the good fortune from time to time, my parents loved Chinese food, and of course they would bring me, and I, I loved Chinese food, I loved going to Chinese restaurants, I, I loved the feeling that was at the restaurant that we went to, with these Buddhas and the music, there was something about the setting, that hit, hit, and the food of course was good too. And I knew that had to do with the East. <laughs> uh, that's really interesting to say, but that, that's what really brought me there. It may not be politically correct to say it, but that's the truth. And, and there was something about the East that I felt drawn to. I, I, my whole life I felt, I felt drawn to the East. And so I, I went to this class, the wisdom of the East, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Zen, and... Um, I walked in, and my professor was sitting on top of his desk in a full lotus position. I had never had a professor like this before. I felt like maybe I entered into Hogwarts. I mean, most of the professors are sitting behind their desks, and they're all kind of uptight, and suit jacket and tie, and there was this guy in jeans sitting on top of his desk in a full lotus position, and he established eye contact and a smile and a welcome to every single person that walked into that room, and I had never been around a person like this before. There was something very genuine about him, something very sincere, something humble and kind. His name was Bill Jackson. And um, so I, I, I started going to this class and I really, it, it, was, it was very unique. And, and then he wanted us to begin by reading the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. The Book of the Tao, The Way of Life, and I started reading this very small book. It's only got like 81 or 82, I forget what it is, I think it's 81 epigrams, little poems, little sayings about life, little reflections about life, and they were absolutely profound to me. I had never been exposed to this type of way of looking at the world. Some of these I would just read over and over again, trying to understand the deeper meaning. They were simple, but yet profound. And there was one in particular, this number 47. I'm just going to paraphrase it here, but essentially it was saying, there's no need to look outside your window for everything you need to know is inside you. And I read this over and over and over again. What is Latsu talking about? What does this mean? There's no need to look outside your window for everything you need to know is inside you. I stayed with this one a long time. What is he saying here? And then it began to dawn on me that what Latsu was saying is that if you want to know something about your life and the world, the mystery... You need to look in here, inside your own heart. That was profound to me because I never thought about that 
in my entire life prior to that moment. When I finally began to understand what Latsu was talking about. And again, I think that's just how lost and confused I was. And so lost and so confused, I didn't even know how lost and confused I was. But here was Latsu pointing, if you want to know something, look in here. And it, this began really my journey in, in the early 1980s that I've been on ever since. This was the beginning of, of, of practice, and by the time I, I uh, moved to San Francisco to uh, enter a graduate school that was called at the time California Institute of Asian Studies that later became the California Institute of Integral Studies, it was there that I, um, a friend of mine, I was studying the Bhagavad Gita and from Hinduism, and the Upanishads, and a friend of mine said, you should take a Vipassana meditation retreat with Rina Sirkar, who's one of the professors there. And so I, she's a trusted friend, and so I took this Vipassana meditation retreat in um, 79 or 80, I forget when. No, before that. Um, and, but anyways, I took this Vipassana insight meditation retreat and... and um, that was another very powerful marker where I got deeply into uh, Buddhism. And, um, and again, you know, I've been on this, this practice, particularly within the Theravadan tradition, but I, I'm very broad-based and have a appreciation for all of the wisdom traditions, for sure. But the Theravada, the, the way of the early Buddhists, uh, is, has a deep resonation with me. But, you know, also within the Zen tradition, I feel very connected as well. So I'm, I'm eclectic, if you will. But at the time, I was studying with, with Rina, practicing Vipassana. And in 1980, she invited me to go to meet her teacher in Burma, in Southeast Asia, Tanpulu Siero, who was a Burmese forest monk. And so I, I went to, to Burma with her and some of our other students, and in, in 1980, I ordained as a Theravada Buddhist monk. And, um, and that's where I was actually introduced to the 32 parts of the body meditation, because um, when you're getting ordained, as they're shaving your head, the monastics are chanting, Ketha Loma Nakadana Tuso, Mantham Naru Atiyata Mesam Wekam, Hariyam Yaganangaloma Gampiyakam Papatham, Antham Andaguna Uduri and Keritam Matulungam, Pe Tamte Mampo Bo Lohi Tamte Do Medo, Athu Watha Ke Lo Tanganika Latikam Mo Dam. So I asked the translator, what, what, what are they chanting? As they're shaving your head, they're chanting over and over again, Gedaloma Nagadana Dazo. And so what the translator said is what they're translating, this is what they're saying. They're saying, head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, large intestine, small intestine, stomach, feces, brain, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, mucus, oil of the joints, and urine. <laughs> 20 solid parts and 12 liquid parts of the body. This is the 32 parts of the body meditation, an anatomical meditation that is found in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness, in the foundation of the body, which is the first foundation. It's the foundation of the body, the foundation of feeling tones, the foundation of mind states, and then the dharmas, the collection of teachings that support awakening. But within the foundation of the body, there is six different practices. Many of us in the West are very familiar with the first three, being mindful of the posture that we're residing in, being mindful of the breath as we breathe in and breathe out, and bringing our clear comprehension of mindfulness to day-to-day -to -day activities. But there's three other practices in this first foundation of the body that are not as practiced as much, but nevertheless they are very important. And so the fourth practice is this anatomical practice of the 32 parts of the body meditation, uh, 20 solid parts, 12 liquid parts. And then there's a meditation, the fifth one, on the four primary elements that compose all material phenomena. 
solidity, liquidity, motion, and temperature. And this is, by the way, is a very powerful practice that helps to dissolve that sense of separation. It dissolves a sense of us and them, dissolves a sense of an inside and an outside, because all material phenomena from Buddhist psychology is made of these solids, liquids, motion, and temperature. Even Albert Einstein once said that separation is an optical delusion of our consciousness. It's a powerful statement from this physicist that separation is an optical delusion of our consciousness. And so from the material form of the elements, you can see that there's some sense to that, that all material phenomena has solids, liquids, motion, and temperature. And so perhaps that sense of the, um, the separate notion of self begins to dissolve to some degree. So this is the fifth practice of the elements. And the sixth practice is a practice on the mindfulness of death. It's actually a very graphic practice, and I'll spare you the nine graphic details, but essentially it's about what happens to a body on the first day of death and then nine different stages of decomposition until the last stage is the body turning into dust. And this is a very powerful practice to become mindful of this ever fragile and impermanent life that we live. It's precious and fragile. So that's the six practices found within this first foundation of the body. So just to go on just a little bit more, um, so studying with, with Rina and then becoming ordained temporarily for some months, and then we invited the monastics to come back to the United States. And so we um, came back and um, and then we invited um, the monastics. We were renting a house in San Mateo and at a certain point um, the Seattle's were saying it would be nice to get a more permanent place. And so within the Western and Burmese community in the Bay Area, we were very fortunate to buy a property in Boulder Creek near Santa Cruz, north of Santa Cruz, near Big Basin State Park, and we, we bought a place that became a monastery that I then lived for the next nine years in, in this monastery. Mostly as a layperson, I was what's called an attendant to the monks, in Burmese, a kapia, which means making things allowable, helping to support the monastics, where I lived and practiced for many years very intensively. And then eventually leaving the monastery after about nine years, and um, which is another whole big story that I won't go into. But um, I needed to find some work, and I got a job at a, at a Cabrillo College Stroke Center here in Santa Cruz, and it was working with people with strokes and Parkinson's, MS, other neurological or orthopedic conditions. My job was a counselor. And part of my job as a counselor, as well as interviewing people coming into the stroke center, as well as supporting people if there's emotional and different things going on, but also teaching classes. And so I began to teach mindfulness there in a group setting. And I would hear anecdotal people saying, this is really helpful. Like I remember this old lady saying, yeah, this mindfulness stuff is keeping me out of the nursing home. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, look at me. I'm an old lady. i got to get up in the middle of the night. i got to pee. And I have to walk from my bed to the toilet. And so with my walker, I'm walking to the toilet, and I'm being mindful of lifting, moving, and placing. And because I'm mindful of walking, I'm not going to end up falling and breaking my hip and ending up in a nursing home. And so I'd hear these like type of stories like this, or people that are beginning to reconnect with their right arm or the right leg that is no longer working the way that it once did and developing a more wiser, kinder, or more compassionate type of relationship. So I remember sharing this with an ex-monk friend of mine, and he said, well, there was a book just written by uh, John Kabat-Zinn called Fulkachesri Living, and I'm going to send this to you. 
And so I, I, he sent me this book, Full Catastrophe Living, and I started reading it, and I couldn't believe some guy had created a whole mindfulness-based stress reduction program for people living with stress, pain, and illness at UMass Medical Center. And, and I, as I read the book, I could see that, that actually there was, in a recontextualized way, some of the essential core elements of the Dharma were, were right there. I was like, wow, I can't believe this. So I actually wrote John Cabot's in a letter, and... Um, a few weeks later, he called me up and um, said you know, we had a nice conversation. He thanked me for writing to him. Said, you know, come and he invited me to come and visit him at UMass Medical Center if I ever get that way. And, and you know, I mentioned to him that my parents are from Boston. I was actually going to be going there in a couple months. And um, so he said, "Great, why don't you come and visit us?" And so I, I, I did. This was like in 1990, I think, right around there. Yeah, 1990. Um, so essentially, I met I met with them, and I was very inspired. Well, I want to start something like this here at the Stroke Center as well. And he said, "Great, go for it. Let, let the curriculums in full catastrophe living, and go go start teaching." Because he knew I was been, lived in a monastery for many years, and um, go start teaching. If you have any questions, give us a call. That was my training. <laughs> And later, of course, they developed, you know, it's much more sophisticated MBSR teacher training and, and so forth. But those were my early years. And so I, I began teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction at the Cabrillo College Stroke Center, then later at the Santa Cruz Medical Foundation. Then actually one of the, um, uh, the first chairperson of the board of Insight Meditation West, which became the Spirit Rock Meditation Center, Howard Noodleman, he was a physician at El Camino Hospital, and he had found out about me teaching MBSR, and he got a second diagnosis of a pervasive cancer that was terminal, and he called me and said, can you come to El Camino and begin the MBSR program there, because I'm not going to be able to, I won't be there. I'm going to, I'm dying. He's also the first president, the chairperson of the board of, of what later became Spirit Rock. And actually, for those of you that are students of Gil Fronsdale, uh, Howard gave Gil his, his sitting group. That's how Gil got involved with, first it was in Palo Alto and then later to, to, to Redwood City. Uh, so Gil and I always talk about that we both have the same patron saint of Howard Noodleman. Like without him, uh, Insight Meditation Center would not have happened in Redwood City, and, and, and the El Camino program wouldn't have happened either. So we're both deeply indebted to, to Howard Noodleman, who um, bestowed th these gifts to us. So I began teaching at El Camino Hospital for, I've been there for actually be 30 years next year, in 2023. And, but I began at, at um, um, yeah, it, it, first teaching at, at the Cabrillo College Stroke Center in 1991, but it, um, in 1993 I started at El Camino, thanks to Howard. And so through the years teaching MBSR, so there I was in more of a mindfulness in the mainstream setting. I don't like to use the word secular, because secular sometimes implies to be not holy, and MBSR is so holy and, and spiritual in its own way, and of course... I'm a long-time Dharma practitioner, and you know I'm a Dharma student that happens to teach. As the just retired as the guiding teacher of Insight Santa Cruz, and actually offered it to uh, uh, J.D. Doyle, who I believe comes to your group from time to time to offer teachings. And I'm so happy with J.D. That's um, the perfect person to take over for me. But I've been very much involved in the Dharma world and the MBSR world. I feel like I'm pretty ambidextrous at this point. And within the MBSR world, one of the primary practices that we first introduce people is this practice called the body scan, beginning with the left foot and working your way up the body all the way up to the top of your head. And... Um, So the, 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 the practices of the body have been very much a, a big part of, of my own practice. And so all of those years teaching MBSR with the, with the body scan, I also have been practicing the 32 parts of the body meditation. 
And it was in 2006, I'm throwing out all these numbers, but it was, it was kind of like 26 years after I was introduced to the body, to the 32 parts of the body. So again, in 1980, I became a Buddhist monk where I was introduced to the 32 parts of the body meditation. And so I kept doing this practice off and on, as well as being an MBSR teacher, teaching the body scan. And finally, in 2006, I had this realization and it might be similar to, I, I, I trust some of you know of Gary Larson and the Far Side. He's a comic. And there's this particular, I should probably pull it out and do a share screen, but I won't. But anyways, it's, there's a picture of um, a cartoon that Gary Larson drew that has a picture of about four or five cows in a pasture. And they're eating grass. And this one cow has an epiphany. A moment of insight, an illumination, a deep realization. And the cow starts saying to the other cows, Hey, wait a minute, we're eating grass. We're eating grass. Wait a minute, we're eating grass. Well, in the same way, in 2006, it's like, wait a minute, we have a body. We have a body. We have a body. Like, there was this moment of, of deep, uh, like, realization in me, like, just how powerful this 32 parts of the body practice is, and that hardly anyone is, is even practicing this, and the West Berlin even knows about this. And so in 2006, I began teaching the 32 parts of the body meditation, first at Insight Santa Cruz, and traditionally, it's a very long practice. I didn't even think anyone would sign up, but some people did. It's, it's eight months long, 33 weeks, where you go through each of these, you're zigzagging, head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin, then you're going backwards, skin, teeth, nails, body, hair, head, hair, then you're doing forward and backwards, head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin, skin, teeth, nails, body, hair, head, hair. <laughs> I know I'm, starting, I'm getting excited, I start speaking too fast. Slow down. But this practice, 33 weeks, eight months of going into the body with these parts was really amazing. Since that time, there's been different reiterations. I began to teach at Spirit Rock once a year for, we've done this for many, many years, a, a week-long 32 parts of the body meditation retreat and, and doing it in other places and just different um, innovations of, of this practice that I found to be so deeply profound. So I'll speak a little bit about that. I'm also just keeping track of the time. And so, Juan, when you said to wrapping up at 10 off, does that mean that the, the, is that the time for the questions to begin, or that's the time where the questions are actually over? Yeah, I, I think the questions can uh, end between 11.50 uh, uh, and 11.55. That should be fine. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to speak a little bit briefly on this um, 32 parts that I do consider to be an absolutely profound meditation. And it's probably one of the weirdest meditations I've ever practiced because it involves uh, reciting the parts out loud. That's why you can hear me so fluidly chant these parts both in Pali and English and forwards and backwards because one part of this practice is to actually chant the parts and it's part of what's called the sevenfold skill in learning that we first need to chant them out to know it verbally then that sets up the condition to know it mentally. And then we need to know the color, the shape, the direction, the location, and what is bordered by. So that's kind of like a map of going into the parts. And so just to say something about these parts, it's quite a list. And as you know, there's way more than 32 parts. And why are there these parts and not other parts? I've, I've had every year I've been teaching this people, why, why these parts and why not the other parts? And, and the, the, the quick answer is, I don't know. And I've combed through the canonical literature and commentaries, and there's really not much to say about why these parts and why this order. So, you know, we, we know that 2,600 years ago, the knowledge of anatomy was not as great as it is now. But even then, of course, many parts were omitted. And so the rationale that I understand after having practiced this for so many years is that I consider these parts to be doorways or gateways into all of the other parts of the body. That's the only way that makes sense to me, that you, know, you, you get in touch with one of these parts and it opens up, like every part is connected to every other part. 
So these are, happen to be the doorways, but why these particular parts? Like, why is feces next to the brain? Did the Buddha have a sense of humor? Or, or I, I, you know, I don't know. Or, but then uh, sometimes we'll talk about the digestive system, actually, in modern science, is, is, is now being regarded more as like, a, like the second brain. So but, so, but why this arrangement and why these parts, we don't know. But there's something to, for example, the first five, when we look at people and beings, those are the parts that we see. We see hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. So that's very interesting. We're starting on the outside. Head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin. And you know, this is something uh, to take note because the cosmetic industry certainly has taken note of it. How much money and time do we fuss with head, hairs, body, hairs, nails, teeth, and skin? It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Fussing with head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, and skin. So part of this practice is beginning to break some of the spells of this enchantment. So for example, when we... When we look at head hair, if you look in a medical dictionary, it'll say, head hair is thin, flexible shafts of hardened cells protruding from the head. That's what head hair is, and that's what body hair is. It's thin, flexible shafts of hardened cells protruding from the head. And it has some function. It, its function is for thermal regulation. Well, if you got head hair, it keeps you, keeps you warm. There's a thermal regulation element and also some protection from ultraviolet light. That's actually what head hair is, but we create a whole world around head hair. Sometimes with my partner and I, when she comes back from the, the getting her hair done, because I don't have to do it anymore, I'll say like, you know, she'll say to me like, how's your thin flexible shafts of hardened cells doing today? And it kind of breaks some of the, you know, like, you know, like I can get so uptight about my hair. You know, thinking about hair, like I was meditating on hair some years ago, and this memory arose, like how much you know, amongst these thin, flexible shafts of heart and cells, we got stories upon stories about them. And as we sit with them, we begin to see them. So this practice reeks of what comes up personally and then the impersonal. It reeks of anatta, of non-self, but then again, the fabrication of self. So for example, I was meditating on head hair some years ago and up came a memory of when I was 13 years old. I had had a bar mitzvah that night, that day. That night was the party for the bar mitzvah party. And I was, uh, I was the, the VIP, if you will, because I was the bar mitzvah boy. And that night was the bar mitzvah party for the bar mitzvah boy. And, and um, I remember the party going into the bathroom, and I brought with me a tube of Brill Cream. I don't know if you remember Brill Cream, and then they used to have this little thing that said, like, a little dab will do you. Well, I thought if a little dab will do you, a lot of dab will do you even better. And so I emptied the whole tube of Brill Cream into my hair, and my hair became so greasy, it was dripping onto the hired suit that I had. I mean, you could make French fries with it, with that hair. Then I was trying to wash it off in the sink, and then it was going everywhere. I was just filled with shame and dread, and I had to go out of that bathroom. I just didn't. So anyways, this whole story just came up as I was sitting with head here. Like the stories that come with all of these parts part of our history, part of our narrative. So this, part, this practice is incredibly evocative. It's like in your face. Like as I sit with my head here, my body here, my nails, my teeth, my skin, as I sit with my feces, with my pus, with my phlegm, with my saliva, with my liver, with my heart, it's very powerful to sit with these parts and to become aware of what it evokes physically, mentally, emotionally. And then, then there's this other part, like that's anatta, which is non-self. It's just thin, flexible shafts of hardened cells. Each of these organs have their part, they have their definition, they have their function. It's just what it is that they do. But then the overlay of what we put onto this is very powerful for us to look at as practitioners. So it's interesting. Head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin. These are the parts that we see with each other. Then... The next grouping goes underneath the surface to muscles, flesh, sinews, or muscles, or connective tissue, 
bones, bone marrow, and then it, it jumps to kidneys. Like, what the heck? Kidneys here. But that's kind of interesting is that the bone marrow is about it's the development of blood formation and kidneys is, is blood filtering, blood purification. So there's some semblance here of some type of connection to things. So anyways, that's a little bit about the 32 parts. There's so much more. Actually, just to let you know, and it's not a commercial announcement, but just to let you know, once a year, um, we've changed the program from 33 weeks to an eight-week online course. It meets once a week, and we offer this at Inside Santa Cruz. I'll be doing this actually at the Sati Center online in the fall as well, an eight-week course on the 32 parts of the body. But to me, it is one of the most profound practices, and my teacher, Temple Lucero, would describe this as the most eminent of the Satipatthanas, uh, the 32 parts of the body that are only taught during the times of, of the, the Buddha's teachings. So anyways, this is, uh, I'm looking at the time and want to give some space if there's some comments or questions. And thank you so much for your uh, attention that I get to tell these stories and <laughs> not bring you to sleep, but um, that I can share a little bit about about this. And... Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for the great talk. And uh, I'm glad like uh, I got to notice that I, I, I was muting uh, the room. And I hope you got to hear some of the laughs that you generated here. Um, so does anyone either here or in Zoom has a question? No. Please, Jeff. I can relate to your story about the uh, milk cream. I once put hair wax <laughs> in my hair, and uh, it was so like wax, but I couldn't get it out, and I felt so embarrassed and shame like you did. It's very funny. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yes. With, within the body, there's so much. So should I call when I see hands up, or Juan, would that be something that you will do? I, I just... I, I, I can do that, too. Um, uh, yeah. I see that Chris has a question, so uh, Chris, can you unmute yourself? Well, I saw Tom had a hand up first, but I'll go for it. Thanks All so right. much, Bob. Um, this song actually came together in the early 90s due to AIDS activism, and we had death just surrounding us and went through the whole decade, and it was a very powerful attractant to getting this song together. Um, the 32 parts of the body, I've tried to do it twice. I should say twice. I've actually done it, but only about halfway because there's so much that sort of um, maps over to like Yoga Nidra or Qigong. Um, many of the neuroscientists now and emotion researchers like Lisa Feldman Barrett, Antonio Damasio, really speak on this whole feeling being that we are. Our mind just almost goes an inch away from our body. I did a lot of modern dance in the in my young, my youth and um, a lot of visualization, so I map over those parts. But I'd be interested in doing this, and I want to just rem um, comment that the Santa Cruz Insight, your senior students and teachers, you have a very powerful group there with J.D. Doyle, that's, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that's through the help of your guidance. I just had a question. Um, a number of teachers I practice with speak about Rena Sirkar a lot, and I don't I just have this vision of her. I don't know much about her except that she taught there at that school, and she imparted a lot of energy to a lot of her students. It's maybe two or three senses about who she was and what she yeah. did. So, yeah, Rena, um, Rena Sirkar was... Um, she she came to the United States, and she taught at um, the California Institute of Asian Studies and Integral Studies, and she's a, a Buddhist scholar and a nun. She grew up in Rangoon uh, with a very um, um, wealthy family, and most of her siblings and uh, father were physicians, but she, uh, from a very early age, was drawn to spiritual affairs, and her, her house be actually later became a monastery for Tumpu Lucero. Tumpu wow. Lucero was her, was her primary teacher. And so Yarina yeah, was a professor of, of Buddhist studies um, in San Francisco. She died a few years ago. And um, 
she was actually my very first Vipassana teacher. She was also known as a healer. She would work with many people with cancer. And um, and an, an amazing, also a Buddhist scholar. I studied Pali with her. Um, quite an amazing person. Good cook, too. And um, uh, Rena, Rena, actually, Rena married my wife and I. We, I was one of her adopted kids, if you will. She was my adopted, one of my adopted moms. Yeah. Okay, Tom uh, has a question as well. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Bob. What a how illuminating to think about all these things. It, it occurs to me that the 32 body part meditation probably dovetails well with the uh, meditation on death and the nine stages of decomposition. I, I think it was nine. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you have any insights on our tendency in the West, our practice in the West uh, by the majority of people to either forestall decomposition through embalming and sealing in a casket and lowering into a you know, a concrete vault in the ground mm -hmm. or to hurry it along through cremation. Mm -hmm. Like what impact do you think that has on, I mean, dead is dead. So we don't know it, I guess, but yeah. I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts? I don't know where this will lead, but do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, you know, ha having been in Burma and one of the practices that we would do in the middle of the night was go to the cemetery and, and meditate on death. And the cemeteries in Burma, particularly in the areas that I was in, which was, um, you know, the, the, I was in a very uh, remote area where the, the main source of trans transportation was ox cart and there was no electricity. And the, the cemeteries were were not manicured. It did not look like colma. And uh, I mean, the, you could find femurs in in you could find, you know, bones in the in the in the cemetery and so forth. Um, I'm an adherent to a green burial if it's possible, if you choose burial or whatever, because um, I, I think it's just natural. Actually, my wife and I we we found it, this incredible place between Santa Cruz and Half Moon Bay called Parisima. Parisima uh, is a is a green burial place, and um, there you can actually you're. A family member can dig the grave themselves. You can put the body in without even a casket or a shroud. Just just dump the body in there and pour um, dirt over it. And I, we like that idea of it being very natural. Um, yeah, I mean, death death is is hidden, and um, but it's it's so funny. You know, I, I was I, I often will do day longs at cemeteries and. There was a period of time where I, I knew the funeral director of this one place, and we would go into the the chapel there, and we would meditate there. And then they they had like a casket room, and so interesting on the caskets there was, there was be these little signs that says uh, we cannot guarantee um, non leakage. <laughs> and, and then I, and then I put my hand on on the on the they have like a little bed, like you know, like a little foam cushion inside the. The casket, and I was going, mm, that feels kind of comfortable. Like, you know, of course, when I'm dead, like, who the hell cares whether it's comfortable or not? I will say one thing, and I don't say this as a political act, but I, I had this realization, and maybe it's because I'm really into the body, and you know, it's very interesting in decomposition. It begins inside the body. It doesn't begin by the guys outside coming to eat you, even though they will. But it's it's the guys that live inside you. There's actually, we're we're like about one tenth human and ninety percent microorganisms. And and so there is the microorganisms within the body begin to eat of itself. That's where decomposition begins. And when I began to realize, like they say that in one square inch of skin lives 32 million bacteria. So there's like way, way more living beings that are living in and on the body than what you think you are. Like I'm the only one in here. There's actually a teaching within the Dharma called <laughs> There's a teaching called Living with the Many. There's actually a literal teaching called Living with the Many. And, and actually, another time I could tell you the stories of Chung Pulisero teaching us about the different organisms live in the body. And um, because of all of this, I've personally decided 
that I don't want my body to be cremated because that would be a, a, that would be like killing millions and millions of beings that could actually benefit by eating the body. So I, I very clear that I want I want my I want this may this body be be a feast to the beings um, there. So that's anyways a few reflections. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, I'm realizing I'm looking at the time. I want to be sensitive, so maybe this is a good place to pause. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Bob. Um, I yeah, I, I really enjoyed this, this Q and A as well. Um, we are, are there any announcements uh, today? First, do you want to talk about having a children summit? Uh, sure, I'll just. Uh... There's been a little Pema Chodron teaching every day with a number of her students and other Tibetan teachers the past few days. We were hoping to get together with a group on Tuesday evening at 7 on Zoom. You're welcome to come. I don't know if there'll be anyone but me there <laughs> or a few. So um, if you'd like to come and hear about Pema or what we sort of saw or learned, uh, we'll be starting at about 7, maybe for an hour, hour and a half. No meditation. Meditate before so that's Tuesday evening at 7. And then I just want to make an announcement. I finished, uh, with the help of others, filling out our teachers, the teachers that will speak through the end of August. And then I'll start up again in fall. I have a lot of, obviously, a lot of openings there. If you have interest in bringing your own teachers to come speak, reach out to them. Or if you have someone you'd like to have invited, I don't necessarily think this is a one-person project doing this. And lastly, Anne Glyde, who spoke about her Dharma a month and a half ago, uh, she agreed to come back for uh, two weekends in July. She has a very busy fall, and she's going to do a thing on basic Buddhism and then sort of mod Buddhism in the modern world, uh, two weekends in July. So mark that on the calendar. That will be coming out. Uh, the link will be just this regular Zoom, num the regular Zoom link. Just go ahead and for the Sunday practice. That's that's the same Zoom link. That'll be at 7 o'clock. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, Grisha, uh, he posted the link in Zoom for uh, the past talks. And also um, a reminder that our practice of Donna is very much welcome. It helped us like keep this space and um, provide uh, some other services, not only for us, but for the community that we try to help. Um, yeah. I'll please. give the host, I'm the host today, and so please stay and enjoy the company of the Sangha after the talk. There are refreshments and hot water for tea. Uh, if anyone uses cups, just leave them in the sink and I'll, I'll take care of them. Uh, I'll be going around with the Donna Bowl to accept contributions to cover our expenses. Your generosity is appreciated. Uh, donations range uh, in the range of 10 to $20 help us on immediate expenses. These include honorarium for our Dharma speakers, rent for this beautiful center, um, and currently not the dinners of Black and Street, and our quarterly newsletter uh, mailed mostly to people in prison. There's a newcomer sign-up sheet on the credenza if you wish to be included and receive our Sangha membership directory, please sign up and include contact information if you wish to share with the group. Some members go out to lunch after the meeting, and everyone is welcome to join them. The group meets at the door around 12.30 p.m. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm just going to come over closer to the microphone. Um, I'm Grisha, and I'm going to put a call out to people to please think about volunteering. We need a lot more volunteers to step up in our fellowship to do things like uh, Zoom hosting, and uh, we send out newsletters to incarcerated Buddhists, and we get many letters from them. We uh, and it takes a lot to respond to them all and to keep the mailing list up to date. So right now, I'm doing a lot of that, and Cass is sharing one of the things with me, but. Um, we really need a lot more help, and I'm going to start asking people individually. But if you feel like you want to step up, and if you have time, a couple of hours every week, then just uh, reach out to me or any of the people on the board. 
and we'll hook you up with some kind actions. Thank you. Thank you, Grisha. Um, Bob, we, uh, would you like to dedicate the merit of the practice? Mm, thank you. Happy to do that. We, we're gonna we're gonna stand in a circle here in the room and okay. uh, that to to dedicate it together. Beautiful. We're ready whenever you are. Okay, thank you so much. So we'll just sit for a moment just to connect with this beautiful spirit of sharing the merit. Which means that born out of our own dedication to our practice, to the good that we are cultivating in our life, and even past goodness that we've done, inviting in to share this merit to all beings, all suffering beings, throughout this world, throughout this universe. May we never underestimate the powers of wisdom and love. May all beings find the gateways into their hearts to grow with greater wisdom and love. And may there be peace. May all beings, here and everywhere, be with peace. Thank you, Bob. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for being with us today. So thanks again, Bob. Thank you very much. Be well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.